I have a question for you. Do you remember last week we talked about counterfeit? We talked about can you tell the real thing from the fake? And if you remember, we brought up a $100 bill and somebody walked away $100 richer because it pays to come to church. <laughs> just kidding. Today, one person will walk out of here $1 million. I'm just kidding. I wish we could do that. I, that'd be awesome, but we can't. Who remembers the dreaded cola wars from the 1980s? Anybody remember this? You remember how Coke started getting nervous that Pepsi was taking market share further and further? So Coke said, oh, we got to tinker with it. And they came up with new Coke. Yes, <laughs> basically Pepsi, right? And then Pepsi, in response, came out with something equally nasty, clear Pepsi. Do you remember that? Crystal Pepsi? And it tasted just like Robitussin with, like, Splenda? It's like, I don't know why they thought that was going to work, but it didn't. And both of them bombed. And I got to thinking, I wonder if today we have one volunteer who can tell the difference between regular Coke and fake Coke, Diet Coke. Is there anybody who can do a taste test? Anybody who knows? Caveman, do you know? You good? Come on up, buddy. All right, let's do it. Give Caveman a hand. Brave boy. All right. So, Caveman, as you come, I'll just kind of explain this. We've got the real deal, Coca-Cola, okay? And we have the fake deal, Diet Coke, which if you've ever tried to make the change, there was once a day I was up to 10 to 12 of these a day. I know, no judgment, it's okay, right? This is, my dentist had a little chat with me. <laughs> said, son, you are ruining your teeth. So I switched to this. Now I'm ruining every other organ. So we got regular Coke, Diet Coke, and then we got Pepsi. And then if you really want to get aggressive, we have Coke Zero, which is supposed to be pretty close and hard to tell. Are you up for it? All right, here's what we're going to do. Why don't you stand right here so those watching online can see. And I want you to face that way, okay? You're probably going to need to drink this, so you want to take your mask off just for one second, and I will, what I'm going to do is, you face that way, I'm going to open one, I'm going to show everybody but you, and then I'm going to hand you the cup, and I want you to tell me which one you think it is, okay? So, everybody see this? Okay, this is going to be first. Hopefully these didn't get shaken up. It's going to be a real interesting experiment. All right, so Cayman, here we go, I'm just going to give you a little bit, and then you can take one of these home to your seat. All right, it's coming around this side, don't look, you got it? All right, you drink that. Those watching at home, our studio audience can see. This is what we got, okay? And if you need to kind of have a comparison, you, you can hold off telling, but if you think you know, you can already tell us. I think I know, but I'm not sure. Okay, all right, okay. Yeah, I'll take that back. Okay, now, this one is going to be choice number two. Right. Everybody wants some, right? A refreshing beverage. Okay, all right. So can everybody see what this is? Everybody got this? This is number two. I'm drinking. Can you, uh, can you tell a clear difference? I promise I'm not playing a joke and giving you the same one like every time. People do that, but. Okay. What do you think? You got an idea? All right. Are you remembering these in order? Yeah. Okay. All right. Because I'm not. All right. Just one, you know. All right. Face forward. I'm going to do another one here to see if you can tell the difference between the real deal and the fake, the imposter. All right. Coming on your right shoulder. Here you go. Don't peek. No peeking. For those following along, this is number three. Yeah. Do you? Yeah. Do you want to, do you want to declare it or do you want to tell us at the end? You think that's Coke Zero? Yeah. Okay, all right. I'm not going to confirm nor deny Great, till the end. <laughs> all right. Okay. One last one. And we'll see how you do. Because they do taste a lot alike. There is a reason why people struggle to tell the difference between the real deal and the counterfeit. My favorite drink. I gotta have some. I was drinking. So, all right. What do you think? All right. I'm gonna stick with Coke Zero being the third one. Okay. Do you think the third one was Coke Zero? Yes. It was Diet Coke. I think Coke Zero is what I usually drink. I'm is it? Is it? That's okay. No, no shame. <clears throat> the last one you had was Coke Zero. I was about to say that. That's so those two. Good. All right. Can you tell the difference between regular Coke and 
Pepsi. I don't remember. I think no. Coke, Coke was first, Pepsi was second. All right. So, hey, 0 for 4. That's okay. That's all right. Listen, you want one of these? You sure? All right. Don't take the Diet Coke because that was mine. So we, got, we have a, a live test here of how you can be deceived between the real deal and a counterfeit. And it works. We see that. Coke Zero is tough to differentiate sometimes, especially if you have a lot of it. And until you get it next to the other one, did you notice his face right away when he tasted Diet Coke? It's like, ooh, rat poison. It just tastes so different, <laughs> right? Because if you're not used to it, but buddy, when you put it right next to a regular Coke or you go and let, I know some of you are like, you're like Coke snobs or Pepsi snob. You go to Chili's or something like, ah, it's like a Coke, and they bring you a Pepsi, but they don't tell you, and you take a sip, oh, I said Coke, you know, and you're like, oh, man, settle down. What is when medical care was hard to get, and they couldn't get doctors to come, so they'd have these guys show up with these traveling caravans with all these miracle elixirs, right, guaranteed to cure baldness. Didn't work. Or some of these other things, Every, any ailment you could name, they had a miracle cure, but they all were always fake. But here's the good news that I want us to take away today. There's nothing fake or counterfeit or inauthentic about Jesus. When Jesus met the woman who was thirsty at the well, he offered her miracle water. He called it living water. And the woman didn't quite understand. He was trying to say this water would satisfy her thirst forever. And she's like, I don't really understand. Are you giving me a miracle liquid? What do I do? And it took her a minute to realize he was talking about authentic spiritual water that would satisfy her needs forever. His exact words were, whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. It will be like a fountain springing up from within into everlasting life. It took her a little bit to grasp who Jesus was and what he was saying. He wasn't offering her a miracle water. He was offering her an, an authentic relationship with the Father. Something that lasts, the real deal. So this morning, we're going to continue our theme of authentic discipleship. Our passage of scripture is going to be found in 1 Timothy. You can turn there, but we're not going to get to it yet because I want to share some background and some context. 1 Timothy chapter 3, go ahead and pull that up. And I also want to share a little bit of exciting news that I mentioned on Wednesday night. And if you've been online, you've seen that uh, I've been bursting at the seams to, to bring you up to speed. Here's the historical context of what's been happening. Paul has been in jail. He's been under house arrest for a long time, and he's recently finally been freed from house arrest in Rome. And he's writing to Timothy, who has proven himself to be a faithful co-laborer for the gospel. He is a respected, good man, and it is awesome that Paul's final letters are always written to young pastors. Young pastors, he would encourage to fan the flame. And you remember last week we talked about what it means to fan the flame. And I used that story about Milo, <laughs> how he would love to play in the flame and get burned. I'm like, you learned your lesson? No, it's worth it. I'm like, okay, bad illustration. But fanning the flame is what Paul is telling us to do. And Timothy has earned the confidence of not only Paul, but other believers all throughout the area. And he would eventually become a, a traveling companion with Paul in his final ministries to Macedonia, all over Asia, all over Greece. But what I find especially cool and absolutely perfect for today is that it's in these letters to Timothy that he gives us a little-known ordinance for the church. See, we're all familiar with baptism. We're all familiar with the Lord's Supper, the two big ordinances of church. But what if I told you there's a third ordinance of the church that sadly is not needed or used very much anymore? And that is the ordinance of ordination. Paul is having a chance here. He actually talks about this. Paul and the servant leadership team of elders lay hands on Timothy to set him apart as a pastor for God's full-time service. If you flip over in 2 Timothy, he actually refers back to that event and says, Timothy, stir up the spiritual gifts of God that you received at your ordination. So today, oh, it is with absolute joy and the giddiness of a middle school boy finally getting asked to that dance with that girl he has had a crush on, I can share with you for the very first time in the history of the potter's hand, in 18 years, we are having our very first special ordination service. I want you to mark your calendars for October 3rd, Sunday morning, 1030, and I want you to spread the word. This is going to be huge. If you've never been to one, I'm going to explain what this entails. 
if you have a little background or maybe you're, you're kind of new or maybe you join us online, 18 years ago, when Pastor Steve and I started this church, we hit the ground running. You can see here in the bottom right and bottom left, this was some of our first schools that we met in back when we had thick hair. And those, in, if you ever complain about bad furniture, look at the bottom right, okay? Those little round discs will kill you. They are lethal. I, I think they're outlawed now, actually. This is, this is where we came from. And when we got together and we started this church, we hit the ground running. From day one, there were two full-time, licensed, and ordained seminary-educated pastors who could jointly shoulder the ministry load together. And for over a decade, we did just that. However, when Pastor Steve retired, we had these two roles. I moved over to assume this role, but we never were able to replace this role with a full-time, seminary-educated, dedicated, ordained pastor. We tried. We wanted to, make no mistake. The leadership was always encouraged, hey, when we get that, when the church is this, and we can have the budget, we want to do that. And we've had fantastic part-time people over the years that have made the church what it is today. But we were always praying and hoping for years, one day, another full-time pastor position would again be a reality as it was when we launched. Many of you have been praying with us for years for the Lord to raise up the right person to answer the call, for an additional full-time minister to come alongside me and help shepherd his church also to help us reach into the community to take our education and our, our preaching and our admin and all these things that are really tough for just one person to come alongside. And after much prayerful consideration, numerous conversations over months that you didn't know about, the unanimous blessing and affirmation of our leadership team of elders, I am thrilled to share with you, we found our guy. A great man has answered the call. On October 3rd, we will be ordaining our very own Jason Holland to the ministry, to full-time gospel. Yeah, you can clap on that. We are so blessed to have Jason, Courtney, and their amazing family here. This is the best of all worlds because we know him. He knows us. We don't have to roll the dice and pray and God bring in somebody from without. We love him. We love his family. He loves us. He already has his master's degree. His kids are growing up and finally going off to college and all throughout these past years, I'm like, hey, man, if it ever opens up, can we bring it? No, I'm good. Man, we can ordain you. We want to do it. No, no, he's very humble, you know, not seeking it, didn't want it. <laughs> and, and finally, all the green lights came together over this summer. And we have been talking and praying. Y'all, I am so excited that God has given us the green light we have been waiting for and praying for. So we are going to celebrate not only the ordination of Jason on the 3rd, but our elders are going to serve the entire church the Lord's Supper. It's going to be a very special time together. Now, if that wasn't awesome enough, there's another great man who has come forward to help us with our growing student ministry. Our very own, who has been here from within for many, many moons, our very own Colin Boggs. He's back there in the booth sporting a awesome new hairdo. Colin has graciously agreed to step up and come alongside Jason and our students. He's already been serving for, for the many months. As Jason begins to assume his new role, his roles and expand his ministry, Colin will help shoulder that, that new load. So God bless you, Colin. Rebecca, we love you. We love your family as well. Thank you for being willing to help pour into the lives of our teenagers. I am so thankful that God is raising up some wonderful people we already know to help advance the gospel. And I can't wait to see what the Lord does in the coming days. Okay, so mark this date. Do not miss it. If you have never been part of ordaining a pastor, it is unlike anything else you've seen. It is so encouraging. It is probably one of the most uplifting times in the life of a church. It is a tragedy. Less and less people are answering the call to full-time ministry because this is actually becoming a rare ceremony in the church, but it didn't used to be. Everybody knew this just like they knew the Lord's Supper or they knew baptism, but ordination of godly men who it literally means to be set apart, to lay hands on, to say, we recognize you. We as a church give you the authority to shepherd us. It's a beautiful, powerful time in the life of a church. Make your plans to be here because we're also taking the Lord's Supper. It's going to be a special day. So with all of that context and what we talked about with Paul writing to Timothy, now you can fully appreciate just how appropriate the text is for this morning. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to start in verse 14 and see how far we get today. Paul says this. I'm reading from the ESV this morning. I hope to come to you soon. But I'm writing these things to you so that if I can't, right, if I delay, 
you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, a pillar, a buttress of the truth. Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. Your translation may even say the mystery of the gospel. And then he goes on to basically break down the gospel. He says this, he was manifested in the flesh. Your Bible may say God was manifested in the flesh. Vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, and taken up in glory. Wow. We read through that and we think, oh, that's pretty impressive. Y'all, we have no idea the profundity that those verses just dropped on us. You want to talk about truth grenades. This is so fun. Our God came to dwell among us. Keep verse 16 handy, okay? We're going to come back to that. I want us to break it down. We're going to look at all six parts of this and exegete this because it is pure gold full of truth grenades. And the first one is the most obvious. But sadly, it's probably the one that is the most underappreciated. And that's this. God was manifested in the flesh. He was manifested. This is a hidden gem hiding right here. I want you to notice the first word in this verse. Notice that Paul didn't say Christ was manifested in the flesh. He intentionally mentions God. As if he's saying, if there was still any doubt of who this incredible God-man is, we want you to equate he is fully God, and yet he is fully man. Paul is saying Christ was not just a mere man, he's also God in the flesh. Now, we're used to that concept. There's just a problem here. Paul's audience wasn't. They looked at him like, what are you talking about? See, we're so used to it, we're blinded by our history, but 2,000 years looking back, oh yeah, Jesus, son of God, he's God, man, we get it, God in the flesh. Y'all, this was radical. He could be stoned for saying this. This was a deadly statement. Think about the implications of what he's declaring. Here's Jesus, fully God, but at the same time, he's fully human. And Paul's not trying to take away from one or the other. He's not trying to diminish his divinity, not trying to, to overemphasize his, his physicality. But it's so important that you know, especially if you are a searcher for truth and you're kind of looking at this Jesus mystery, his body was the exact same as ours. His flesh bled. It hurt. He went through pain. He felt the weather. His knees might ache when it rains. He knew everything. We knew. He had to. It had to be that way so that he could identify with us completely. John 1.14 echoes this. He says, the word literally became flesh and dwelt among us. We've heard about this at Christmas. We've seen his glory. Glory is of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. Now, the fancy word for this, if you're a seminarian, is incarnation. And it literally means coming down and becoming in part of the story. The incarnation, God becoming flesh. There's a great book called Theology of the Church Leadership, and it says this, the doctrine of the incarnation is distinct and unique to the Christian faith and the Christian faith alone. Sure, other religions speak of appearances of their deity, their God. They might come in the guise of men or animals or maybe even idols, but these are appearances only. None of them take the startling, radical position of Christianity, which affirms God, the one who existed from eternity past, the one who created all things, now enters into his creation and actually becomes a human being. But this is precisely the radical affirmation of the Christian faith. Oh, it is radical. We're so comfortable with it, we forget. This is radical stuff. The idea that God would take on flesh come and write himself into our story to walk among us? No, this is astounding. To subject himself to hunger and pain and the weather and all the things we deal with, this is amazing. Because without his willingness to do these things, he would always just end up being like God up there. That makes sense? He would always be the God out there somewhere rather than the God who is with us, our Emmanuel. Look at verse 16 again, because it continues. He says, Jesus was vindicated by the Spirit. The magic word there is vindicated. If you're not familiar with the word, it literally means justified, or better yet, declared righteous. When Jesus came to earth, he didn't come as a conquering military general. He didn't come as a warring, mighty king who's shouting the splendor of God. He could have said, hey, nobody puts baby in a corner. Don't do that to me. But he didn't. He took on the form of a lowly servant. 
so that the ministry of the Holy Spirit would come and identify him. He submitted to baptism, taking on the same forms we do, leading the example. The Spirit justifies him, descends on him like a dove. One of the few times the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit are seen together in Scripture, and we hear the voice of the Father saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Then he goes on to bear the humiliation of our sin on a cross between two hooligans, two thieves, murderers, bad guys, He's debasing himself. He's doing all of this, taking on the flesh. And then the Holy Spirit declares Jesus to be the Son of God by doing the unthinkable and raising him from the dead. This is the gospel. Romans 1.4 puts it like this. And he was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness. Who's that? It's the Holy Spirit. By his resurrection from the dead, he is Jesus Christ, our Lord. The fact that God raised Jesus from the dead ends all debate of which faith is legit. Every other one you could go, you can find their bones. Every other ruler, every other teacher, every other prophet, their tombs are not empty. Jesus is the only one, and rising from the dead is proof he is who he claimed to be. Keep looking at verse 16. Look back. Next we see Jesus was seen by the angels. Y'all, do we understand the weird and crazy cool relationship Jesus must have had with angels? Those who existed before us, who are looking around, when deep in the heart of the Father, he dreams up this incredible plan to make you and I, and the angels are standing there, I can imagine gathering around, looking down on tiptoe, saying, what is the Father doing? And he's forming mud and dirt and breathing the life breath into his lungs. And the angels are like, what is this? And they know from eternity past who the Son of God is the triune existing God, and they say, what is happening? Who knows how much the Father had shared and revealed? This, to think of the, the, the revelation that they got to see. Remember, angels are not omniscient. They don't know everything. They're not God. And we see these examples from Scripture, the angels showing up from his birth all the way through his resurrection. Of course, there's those famous ones we always hear at Christmas, like, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host. Praising God and saying, you know, right, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth and, you know, the thing, right? You go on and on. And then there's the one in verse 24 where he says, while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. Other gospels record, we know these are angels. But have you ever really thought about Jesus' relationship to the angels? Because they had an intense fascination with the Son of God. From the time of his conception, as we know him as Jesus, to his ascension in heaven, an angel announced the conception to Mary. Angels were the ones who declared his birth to the shepherds. Angels attended him after his temptation in the wilderness. It was an angel who came and strengthened him in his agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. Angels came and announced his resurrection at the tomb. Angels addressed the disciples at Christ's ascension, saying, what are you doing staring up into heaven like this? He's coming back the same way. And the reference we see right here is to Jesus' resurrection from the dead, which secured God's victory over Satan. Look what he does next. Verse 16, we read, Jesus was then proclaimed among the nations. Mm -mm -mm. This is the Great Commission in action. We are talking about the proclamation of Jesus to the entire world. Look at Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, Some authority in heaven has been given. Oh, yours doesn't say that? All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name, this is why we do this, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. It is a powerful commission. This is your commission now. As the disciples of our generation, this falls on us. There's another similar command repeated at his ascension in Acts 1.8. It says this, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all of Judea and Apex and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Did you catch this? Notice that in both of these instances, Jesus' command was to go into the entire world proclaiming Jesus and inviting people to become his followers. So you know I got to ask, don't hate me. As your friendly neighborhood pastor, how you doing with that? 
This is our mandate. To invite people to be followers of the Lord Jesus. Now that's exactly what the disciples did. They surrendered all. They left everything. And they went and they witnessed and they preached and they helped lead people to repent of their sins. They didn't get sidetracked or distracted. They didn't go around chasing waterfalls. They didn't want no scrubs. They stayed straight on the path and they stayed on mission. And thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people came to faith in Christ. And now millions came to faith in Christ. Y'all, we stand on the shoulders of these legends. And as a church, this is our commission. Just because, you're, just because you may not be here, you don't get out of this. If you're watching online and you're out of state, this is our mandate, our commission to proclaim the name of Jesus among the nations. We do that. We share who Jesus is. We tell them what Jesus has done. If you don't know how to do it, can you tell them what Jesus did in your life? Can you share the truth? Hey, I was once this way, and now I'm this way. Let them know that the same thing's available to them. If you don't know anything else, in a nutshell, here is the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15. Memorize this. For I deliver to you as of first importance. Okay, that means numero uno. This is it. That Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. It all comes back to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. That is the gospel in a nutshell. This is what we tell the world so that they have a chance to do the next part in verse 16, which is this. Jesus was believed on in the world. He was believed on in the world. Most of you in this room hopefully have already done that. Whenever the message of Jesus is proclaimed, you will frequently see people accept that message. You know why? Because they're hungry and they're searching. We see unbelievable amounts of people coming to faith in Christ overseas. So much so we literally cannot talk about it because it will stir up so much opposition they will be slaughtered. Unbelievable amounts of people hearing the gospel for the first time. People from other faiths going, we've never heard about this freedom. We've always heard about a God of guilt. And we come along and say, no, our God died for you. He's not calling you to go and blow yourself up. He's not calling you to go and slaughter. He's not calling you to do that. He wants you to share the gospel of peace. And they are believing on this. John 1, 12 says this, to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gives them the right to become children of God, who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of the man, but of God. Did you catch that? This is so deep, so profound. After Jesus' death and his resurrection, his ascension back to the Father, the early church followed the mission of Acts 1-8, and they proclaimed him everywhere. And thousands upon thousands of people who had nothing in common with each other listened, were converted, and obeyed, and went on missionary journeys, and eventually most of them were martyred. They were killed. All the disciples except one we see gave everything. They sacrificed. Y'all, we are their faithful legacy. The fact that we are sitting here today talking about this, people that we know now from rich, wealthy nations are finding kinship with people from the poorest third world countries. How is that possible? Because Jesus breaks down all barriers. There's no wall. There's no Jew or Greek or Gentile or pagan or heathen. When you come to know Jesus, he unites us as one family. Think about that. we got people living in mud huts still communicating with smoke signals using 3,000-year-old languages who are immediately kindred spirits with people living in skyscrapers talking on smartphones. They have nothing in common. How is that possible? It's because of Jesus and the unity that he brings, this kindred spirit. He tears down all barriers. We're here today as a result of those who listened, heard the good news, and then shared it with somebody so you could hear it today. They were willing to do that. Sometimes they sacrificed everything. So you know I got to ask. Let me pause. What about us? Take a minute. Don't answer out loud. Looking back in the last month, year, is there anything you can think of that you offered as a sacrifice for your faith? Is there anything in your life you can point to and say, that was a genuine sacrifice? See, David said, that which cost me nothing, I will not offer to my God. If it cost me nothing, it's not a sacrifice. 
Sometimes sacrificing everything is what makes it possible for us to know Jesus, for us to be here to worship today. And lastly, we see the end of verse 16. Jesus was taken up into glory. This is it. This is the reference. Jesus ascending from the dead after his resurrection. Acts 1 describes the scene like this. You can read it for yourself. Until the day when he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles, whom he had chosen, he presented himself alive to them. Okay, so they could see him. They could touch him. Remember, Thomas got to put his hand in the, in the print in his, in his wrist and in his side. He presented himself alive them after his suffering by many proofs appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. Can you imagine being there and hearing that? Hearing about the kingdom of God, he'd already come back. Then look at verse 9. He says, and when he has said these things, as they were looking, okay, they're watching this, he was lifted up and a cloud took him out of their sight. Jesus' last miracle was witnessed by many. His last miracle was flying. Now, if you don't think that's cool, I remember wanting more than any other superpower to be able to fly. It looks like you're going to be able to do that. When I was 11 years old, my dad took me to see David Copperfield. Anybody ever seen David Copperfield live? My goodness. If you've seen him on TV, made the Statue of Liberty disappear, walked to the Great Wall of China, and I got to see him in Washington, D.C., and they brought out this massive aquarium, almost the size of this room, and they put David inside it, closed the lid, and the dude begins to fly. And I'm like, okay, they got wires. That's when they put the lid on. And then he starts doing this. And he starts flying this way, and I'm like, okay. And then he starts going this way. I'm like, okay, all right, it's got to be some wire. got to be something going on, because otherwise he got a demon. And something's happening. And then he turns, and he flies out over us. And I'm like, what is happening? This is the coolest man ever. He was flying. Y'all, I witnessed that, but I know there was smoke and mirrors. I know something was up. Remember, this had never happened before. We're used to hearing about him going up. Like, y'all, they witnessed it. Can you imagine? We're sitting here talking, and we're talking, let's say I'm talking to Thomas Rassiano. I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? He's like, hang on a sec. I got to go. And he just starts to like, do, 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 up to the roof. Our jaws would hit the floor. See, we're so comfortable with these stories that they're just stories. He was literally taken up while they watched, eyes wide open, jaw on the ground, staring in pure wonder, and they witness this. And there is coming a day when Jesus will return, and we will meet him in the clouds. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. It says, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air. You get to fly. There it is. No David Copperfield wires. And so we will always be with the Lord. We will never be separated from him again once we have this presence, this moment. This is the day that keeps me going. This is the day that should charge your jets. This is it. This is what we're looking forward to. You wonder how you keep going, putting one foot in front of another when the world is on fire? This. Knowing where it's all going. This is the hope when we will see our Savior face to face in all his splendor and never separated again. Anybody know who Father Damien was? Oh, yeah. Pastor Bill knows. A couple of you might recognize this man. I'm going to close with this story. Instrumentalists, you guys can go ahead and, and come, on, come on back up here. Father Damien was an amazing, humble priest who became famous because he was willing to go serve those who were stricken with leprosy. The village was Kalaweo, and it's a village on the island of Molokai, which is Hawaii, one of the Hawaii islands. And this whole island had now been quarantined, does this sound familiar? Quarantined to serve as a leper colony for people to go and die. That was it. Everybody knew that. If you went there, it was a death sentence. This guy went willingly. And for year after year, in fact, 16 years in total, he lived in their midst. He learned to speak their language. He didn't know it. He bandaged their wounds. He hugged them. He embraced their bodies when no one else would touch them. And he preached to their hearts that otherwise would have been left abandoned and alone with no gospel. Then he built them homes. He was legit meeting not only their spiritual need, but their physical need. He gave these homes so these lepers would have shelter. He organized schools, even bands and choirs, so that the kids could have some sense of normalcy and community. It was a beautiful thing. 
The downside of caring was he also had to build, by hand, 2,000 coffins. As he loved them through life and watched them die. He did 2,000 coffins by hand so that when they died, they could be buried with dignity. Slowly, it was said, his presence changed Kalawao to now no longer being a place to come and die, but a place you could live. Because Father Damien offered the hope of Jesus. He knew what was truly important and where this world was heading. And he wasn't squeamish around them. He wasn't fearful about keeping his distance. In fact, he did nothing to separate himself from his people. There's a famous story about the poi bowl where they would pass it and they would dip. And he would dip his fingers right inside just along with every one of the patients he was treating. He shared the peace pipe with them as they passed it around. He said, I didn't always wash my hands or have a chance after I bandaged open wounds, but he got close. And he did this year after year after year. And for this, the people loved him. And rightfully so. Then one day, as usual, he stood up in front of his small little congregation and he began his Sunday message with two words he had never said before. Something was different. And he said, we lepers, and they knew exactly what that meant. See, now he wasn't just among them helping them. He was one of them. And from this day forward, he wasn't just their friend on their island trying to help. He was in their skin. From this moment, when he had chosen to live as they lived, now he would die as they died. Now there was no mistaking they were in it together. He was part of them. Do we understand what the incarnation meant? One day, God wrote himself into the script, came to earth, and walked among us. This is unheard of. He wasn't just among us to help us. Now he was one of us. He was in our skin, and we are in it together. Because of Jesus, because he came to earth, and he could say, we, it changed everything. Do you know him? Or do you just know about him? So hearing all this today, I want us to look one more time at that key verse in verse 16. It says, he was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated. He was justified. He was declared righteous here by the Spirit. He was seen by angels. He was proclaimed among the nations. And he was believed on in the world and taken up into glory. Everything we do is because of Jesus. Never forget who he is. Never forget what he's done. It's so easy because we're so blessed. We're so comfortable. All our needs are met. I just want to bring it home today. Look at what he did for us. Look at what he will do for those who come to him. Oh, church, I want us to be the kind of people that unashamedly share this news every chance we get. Let's pray together. Would you bow with me right where you are? Before we sing, before we stand and we open the altar, Lord, we invite you to speak to us now. Speak to us about our commitment. Speak to us about being a follower of you. May we be faithful and authentic. May we point people to you, not wasting any day, any moment. You are so good to us, so good, and we thank you. We love you. We bless your holy name, the only name given by which men can be saved. Thank you for meeting with us in this moment. Holy Spirit, speak to us. You are welcome in this place. In Jesus' name.